Hello, I'm not ready. <laughs> I'm really nervous. Yeah, I don't think I've ever turned up to anything quite so unprepared. And my slideshow isn't really finished either, and we've deleted some stuff out of it. It's not working, but there'll still be a few errors. So mostly it's just photos. But myself and my husband work for ourselves, and we manage for biodiversity and recreation. But obviously I'll leave out the, most of the recreation bit for today. So I'm just going to stand up really and talk about myself and a little while and what we do and most of the photos will either have been taken where I grew up which is a farm in Carmarthenshire which is probably a very bad farm compared to what the neighbours are doing if you depending which way you look at things because we yeah the I think all of these were apart from the wax caps weren't that mums actually so yeah that's still all there and um, then we go off and we work on other people's sites as well but it's quite random we do anything from mountain bike trail inspections and trail repairs and looking after those to doing habitat surveys and peak depth surveys and actual practical management work. So I thought if we worked through the year, starting in April, and um, gradually just going through and um, yeah, talk about things and then feel free to ask me questions as we go along. So yeah, basic more around meadows obviously because it's the meadows group, but we do work in woodlands and on trees and stuff a bit as well. But meadows are funny things, aren't they? Because they're kind of trying not to be meadows half the time and struggling to get into something else. And this was a hedge that I coppiced just before lockdown, just literally before it all happened at the end of the month. And then um, the fence was put in during that really dry weather. And I took this photo in the last week, I suppose, and just to demonstrate this call, the rest of the field gets grazed occasionally, but um, yeah, this call just shows what happens if you're not looking after it and all the bramble stock coming out and um, the little saplings come in and things start creeping in and then of course eventually the meadow, if it all went on, would turn into a more scrubby woodland thing. So unfortunately, most of what we're going to do with the field is manage it, isn't it, to keep it into some kind of state and I suppose before we created fields and hedgerows and things then wild animals would have come through and done that in patches and um, this one is one of the slides that's gone wrong hopefully the last one that we didn't manage to delete the text boxes out <laughs> and in a similar so in a similar corner of a field this is a bit um, that hasn't been grazed for a few years and um, it's just to show really what happens when the grass just grows up and isn't removed and you get that thatch covering and wildflowers need light to germinate so I dug a little hole with my hand just to show how dark it is down there but if things like a yellow rattle and things are starting to pop up now then they're going to struggle to get up through this mass and sometimes what can happen is you'll actually end up with the more competitive species managing to get through like your soft brush and your thistles and sometimes nettles and things will come through then but yeah sometimes the more delicate stuff will find it a lot harder to go through so even though we're in April now and in the growing season, I think the old tick of our recommendation was that you took your stock off by 20th of April, which is always handy to have a date in mind, isn't it? But every year is so different. And this year is so different from last year. And the field up in the top right there is actually kind of the flip side of where the horse is. It's just looking in the other direction. And you can see the standing water in there this week that... Uh, uh, yeah, it's just ridiculous at the moment. The sheep are just paddling about. So this isn't a particularly species-rich field, but it has, there have been orchids up at the top side behind the horse, and it could be a lot better, but it is one that we are, well, my mum is, is kind of using as priority for the sheep, so the horses are just down there at the moment helping out. But just to see the difference in the sward height, really, of, of having the grazing in there. So what we've done is we've got the sheep in there over a large area, and then we're using the horses to graze off the soft brush, they were topped at the end of last year and so the horses are eating and, and we're just moving them along. And what Maple's actually doing is stood there telling me that she doesn't want the rushy bit, she wants the bit up there where there's more thistles because she goes in and digs this little hole and eats them out of the ground and um, the sheep don't do that. So it's really interesting how, how different all the animals eating habits are and yeah, where you want to go with that and what you want to do. So the sheep are just avoiding all of the soft brush and the horses are grazing it off. But where I really want them at the moment, and where they were this year, was in the field behind, which is marshy grassland, but it is so wet in there now. But they, this time of year, last year, I had them just doing a little bit to open that up, because they've been in there in the autumn, and I need to go back, but um, yeah, I've had to give up on that at the moment. 
So, yeah, ideally you'd be thinking about getting your animals out now and not letting them poach it up. But sometimes a little bit of an open sward can help things germinate and things move around. But one year, when I lost one of the horses very suddenly, um, we had to keep a pony in, a, in another field adjacent to some neighbours who had horses just to try and pacify her a bit. And so she ended up in there until mid-May, I think, which wasn't planned at all. But actually that was the first year that, well, the most orchids we saw came that year. So I think perhaps because it had had that extra bit of vegetation clearance and, I don't know, maybe just taken the grass back a bit, either we saw things we hadn't noticed before or they had more opportunity to come out. So I think sometimes you do have to be really flexible. You can't always just put a date in and yeah, follow a management plan in that way. You have to use your brain, because this year and last year was so completely different. The field, yeah, the field behind is just absolutely sodden now. So yeah, it's just... Um, and then obviously that's what we're aiming for, It's just to go through spring and summer, and to come up and, I mean, you all know what, the photos are all here, but I suppose try to find ways that you can enjoy it then, and whether that's making paths through it so that people can walk about, or um, just sit in there and make records and take photos, and I've got ridiculous amounts of photos that I intend to go through at some point and log and kind of record, and if there's something that I don't quite know what it is, a bumblebee or something, then I try and get a photo of it, so at least then you've got dates and things and I think perhaps in terms of management one of the most important things is knowing what you've got or what you did have and what's where in the field because things move around with us as well is that you, sometimes the orchids will be in one area and then they'll start to move around and whether that's weather or grazing or cutting or yeah what it is you've got to think yeah think a bit about yeah how that's all going along and it's not always in just a field one of the recreational jobs we had a few, for a few years, a few years ago, was cutting for NRW around their forest sites, and the bottom one is close to their office in Llandovery. And they were very understanding with my strange habit of leaving patches of grass and flowers, and, um, but also trying to keep it tidy and look like it's ready for visitors. And we had um, management of the church in Llandilo as well at the time, but that's um, under a new committee now and they've decided to cut it more regularly and, and do it differently but it's amazing what came up in the churchyard having just left it for periods of time and the sites, so the three NRW sites there, they were all um, cut during April and perhaps beginning of, of May apart from so the bluebells were being avoided and I never actually had any complaints for anything, we had nice comments from the NRW ones but um, we did get complaints in the churchyard there was a lot of people who weren't happy about how that was managed and that it was just a mess, which is a bit of a shame because there was a lot of plants there. But what we did try to do, and I haven't shown the past in the church yet, is just to cut around different places, like cutting around the sides, cut around the edge of the curb if you can, just make it look like somebody's been there and it's not that they've just forgotten to come that month. And I suppose with the No Mo May thing, we, we struggled with that a bit when it first came in. I don't know how other people feel about this because sometimes we were asked not to go in in May to leave that and then suddenly at the beginning of June we went to go in and cut everything off and that's almost when it feels like everything's just starting to come up and I think it was more obvious in, from, a, um, from a wildflower point of view anyway. It was more obvious in the church in a way because where we were cutting regularly along the sides of the paths you would go back for the June or July cut and it was amazing what flowers had come up I suppose partly because you've reduced the grasses in there as well it's all more obvious. And um, yeah, so it's a tricky one, but um, it, is, it doesn't mean that just because you have somewhere that's open to the public or something that you don't have to enjoy it. And um, different things come up, especially the site down in the right hand side. I'll show you one that was taken later in the year when there's lots of devil's bit scabious there then. So yeah, different things at different time of the year. I was cutting around to make them, but nobody seemed to mind too much that I was um, doing this funny gardening thing. And then this is part of the hedgerow that I coppiced and was taken actually later that year when it was that silly dry period in lockdown. And this is one of those multi-stemmed willow things that um, I'm assuming somebody either nibbled or knocked off at some point many years ago. And we cut it back as part of the hedgerow restoration. And um, that's just showing you how much growth can come back it, when things aren't chemically treated, because obviously we wanted the, the hedgerow and we're leaving stuff anyway for habitat and cover along the way. I think this one's just outside the fence line, which was why there's a big stack of logs there from a fallen branch ages ago. 
But yeah, it's one of those management things that just because you cut something off, it's so ongoing that yeah, within a couple of years you will and will be back up again. Um, yeah, there's lots of arguments for and against weed killers and their use and different things, but um, yeah, I'll touch on that again perhaps with the rushes later and different things. So everybody has different opinions on how it should work, but some sites it is very useful if you do paint a stump, if you know you're not going to be able to get back, because otherwise you've got that to deal with in a couple of years, but then yeah, you've still got to handle the chemical and make it safe and make it safe for people as well. So we've got some sites where we've done done a lot of scrub control with hawthorn and blackthorn and things as well and um, yeah they all regrow in the corners of fields and so then full-on summer grows this field um, is a yeah is a customer as well and is actually grazed by lightly grazed by ponies most of the summer months but has an awful lot of flowers still surviving in it but also has a lot of weeds and stuff and I think sometimes to do with the latrine areas of the ponies there's a lot of nettle and dock, but even in that top right-hand corner with all of those weeds and things going on, there is a bit of an orchid down in there somewhere amongst it, if you can see. And there's also an issue with ragwort. So this is our little Grillo ride on mower that's a brush cutter, and it's brilliant fun. It's just basically you get paid for driving around on a go-kart. <laughs> and um, it's quite good fun as you go higher up this field. It's a bit more slopey, so it will, um, yeah. A bit like sledging and stuff, isn't it? It's good fun. So that's the whole point of why we set up what we do, is because we just try to base it around things that we enjoy doing. Really. And um, so we went in there, we're cutting round, but you can be quite accurate, even on that, you're sat on it, you can see where the wheels are. If you walk roughly through first and pick out what you want to do and what you want to cut and what you want to save and pick out the banks that you want to leave, and then you can go in and, I mean, there's still a thistle in there and a couple of nettles, but you can go in and either hand pull those out with gloves or snip them off. Secateurs in a field are amazing. What you can do with secateurs and a little pruning saw is actually incredible. But because the ponies were grazing in here, I went round and collected a lot of the ragwort first and tried to remove that, but still tried to keep my eye out as I was going around because, yeah, ragwort's mostly dangerous to ponies. I'm sure most of you already know that if you cut it and it's dry, then it seems more palatable to them and is dangerous rather than when it's standing. But there is quite a bit in there and it's heavy old stuff when it's got mud attached to the roots as well but it's a really interesting sight that one because the ponies there don't seem to eat the thistles and I'm not sure if this is because the type is different and um, but then you, your ponies eat nettles mine don't touch nettles yeah. don't they so it's, you've really got to play with the options that you have so yeah all the animals that you have or whether you're cutting and um, yeah you've got to be so flexible because sheep and cows and everything seem to do completely different things. What do you do with the, the horizons? Do, do they get... They have been or? left there, yeah. but in other places we do, yeah, yeah. we do break take them, them off, break them off or blow them or, yeah, pile them or, yeah, drag them and things, but in that one, yeah, unfortunately they're left. For some reason, that's a bit of a quirky field, even though it's got interesting species in it, it's priority at the moment doesn't seem to be the wildflowers completely although yeah it's a funny one yeah I'll perhaps talk to you about that later because <laughs> it's yeah I've always wondered why why it wasn't being managed more for that there must be other priorities on the site I think that are costing more money and uh, yeah it's good and then Bracken if anybody's ever had to deal with this one it's um it is a bit of a monkey really it just keeps coming back and that is how big it was the trees grow up around and I think in this site there's this warm little glade and it's drawn up and it just smothers pretty much anything else that is trying to live and breathe. There's a bit of blackthorn and stuff in there as well but when there's br the bramble and seems to grow up and then the bracken comes up through it and um, yeah and then you'll get some saplings through that and it just marches on across your field if you just leave it be. It's such a clever plant and um, some people really like rolling it you can roll it in June when it's first starting to come up and then roll it again in July. But the problem on most of the sites that we've worked on with bracken is that it is usually combined with bramble. So we've found that cutting it is better. And again, you can do that cutting of um, the two cuts or you can wait until is it the second bonds have unfolded, sort of July or August time and just really batter it then. And as long as it can't draw back down, all the energy, it's, you know, it's photosynthesizing all the time, so it's taken all of that into the leaves, 
and as it starts to go brown it'll suck all that back down into the rhizomes and be really ready to go next year so it's a really cruel way of dealing with something but if you chop it all off you're kind of starving it and um but you do with that you make an incredible amount of mulch from something that big but it's also so amazing when you go back in the winter if you've cut it in the summer the difference to the grasslands is yeah absolutely fantastic so we can drive through something like that with the grillo usually depending whatever what else is in there or we just strum it and stuff like that but yeah rolling is something we've always wanted to do or crushing but we usually end up having rumble in there as well so you've got to be a bit careful and then this, you get to that late summer stage when you're going to start removing your, if you're doing a hay crop and taking it off. And if you're lucky enough to have a neighbour with a tractor or your own kit and you can bail and move it all out and then um, or sell it or use it for your own animals, then that's brilliant. But it seems to be quite a challenge for a lot of people to make the hay. Yeah, or have it made in the way that they want. And this site is particularly challenging because of the access. It's quite steeply sloping anyway, so you wouldn't get your average tractor and baler and machinery kit in there. We've mown it with the Grillo mower before, but we've lost the access to get the Grillo mower in there now across the river. So we have to cut all this by hand. It's usually been strimmed. It'd be really lovely to be able to scythe the whole site just because of where it is. It would feel it would feel really good to be scything up there, but it's um yeah, we tend to sit there and make a lot of noise and um, use a strimmer. Cut it all by hand, and it, I think it's actually steeper than it looks in there as well, because you're, so you're walking back and forth getting foot ache. Um, and then we leave it for a couple of days to dry out, partly because that's much easier to move it all as well. Trying to move wet grass is, is hard work. It's heavy old stuff, and it's really labour-intensive, and I can't imagine how any kind of normal person, this is a nature reserve sort of area and um yeah it's a it's a it's an expensive thing to be doing but i absolutely love the place and the opportunity to be there so because of the plants that grow there and quite often the time of year there's still a lot of bees and things feeding up there up in this higher field we tend to leave patches um on rotation so i'll try and go back to the photos that i took the previous years and try to make sure that certain areas have been left within it so we um yeah, we take off some patches but clear the majority of the field and take the stuff around the outside where there's shade and leaf litter and things, it always is a bit more rank, so we try not to leave that in there. And then the whole lot has to go down to the bottom of the field, to the compost piles, which you've got slope and speed on your side is really helpful. Don't ever try and drag grass uphill, it's just miserable. So we started off just raking it, and somebody before us raked it for years as well, raked it down, took it up, dragged it onto the piles, and then my very clever husband, who I fought it for quite a while until I actually tried it, walked along with a leaf blower and blows it down into rows. You get to a certain stage where your rows get too big and too fat and they sort of, they're struggling to roll them. But the amount that you can get down the hill, I think we probably do this in about two rows. And then I pile it and fork it. And my parents' old pitchfork that's broken on the top is my loyal, loyal friend up there. And... I think it was probably second hand when they had it in the 70s and now I've got it. And a big old tarp that's folded in half with some knots in handy corners to make sure that it drags in the right way and collects the grass. And I literally just fork it on there and drag it the last bit to the pile that you can't get the leaf blower to do the work on. So it's very labour intensive. Most people probably think I'm completely mental. And um, probably are, but actually it's the most beautiful place to work. And if you can give up the bits of using the machines, then you just sit up there sometimes and look across the valley and then when you go back up the next year and you see what's there and the amount of flowers and it just wouldn't, there was bracken along the top and down the side of this field coming in and, um, and I think in the past, the history of going way, way back, this whole field was covered in bracken and somebody actually did plant it up the trees thinking it was the right thing to do and then someone else came in and removed most of them. But yeah, there, there would be an issue with bracken here if this wasn't being done and it wasn't being looked after. I think a lot of it would be lost. So yeah, it's one way of getting around a problem, but it's very, it's very labour intensive, very expensive for somebody to be there to do that. And not everybody has the luxury. But it is something that you could do yourself, in, because especially with the way that we leave it in rotation, you can see there's a patch right at the far end that hasn't been cut. You don't have to do it all in the same week because we're being paid to be there. We tend to do that 
we've got all the kit up there. We've had, yeah, we've managed to get stuff in. We, yeah, this year we even carried water in in advance so that we had all of that. Um, yeah, the weight of the water was done and up there for the week, and um, then yeah, we try and get it done and gone. But if it's in your own fields and you've only got a 50 metre walk, then you can do sections whenever you get good weather and you can do some sections later in the year and some sections earlier in the year and see how it happens. But I've seen more slow worms and newts and things up there doing that than anything else. And then compost piles, ideally downhill if you can, somewhere where you might get run, run off onto something habitat that's important or nice. And they rot down incredibly quickly. And by the time you come back the next year, because these end up all being in the same sites, there's a bit of tufts of coxfoot and some Yorkshire fog and stuff growing around them, but there isn't really a huge amounts of evidence. It's just a bit squishy when you stand on it and slimy, really. But then they're very good for things, which I assume is probably why they've got so many slow worms and things up there, and they're good for grass snakes and other little beasties. But yeah, the amount of stuff that gets dragged down there and heaped up, and then you go back the next year and there's just a bit of a lumpy mound really but it is a bit of a crazy crazy option um yeah not everybody would be able to do that and then another way by doing it with animals is this one with strip graze the pony started off with a strip right along the hedge at the back and we just moved the fence every day probably twice a day we just move it out a little bit in different ways and that means that they really focus on the strip the strip of fresh grass and clean that off so even though it just looks like badly overgrazed pony paddocks at this point, all the poo is being picked off and cleaned away. And then what you're left with is a similar, in a way, to if the hay had been taken, but it's obviously happening over a, a slower period of time. And the only things that they're really not eating much of there is the dead old docks. And I tend to go along with the secateurs and just cut that, those bits off. And um, yeah, do something with them afterwards, or go back and strim afterwards. But because you're picking up the poo, most of the nutrients are going, and then that gets shifted off to a garden. And um, yeah, they gradually. They don't always eat all of the buttercup in this with, with these ones anyway. But even some of that goes sometimes. Yeah, they're just. Um, but maybe it's because I'm so cruel and I'm starving them so badly that um, yeah, it, it gets worked along. But yeah. Just another way of doing it. I've seen somebody do that in Pembrokeshire as well with um, Dexter cattle. And they had the luxury of being at home most of the time and could go out and move it every few hours so that they were doing it. But they had the same system. They weren't picking up their poo. But um, yeah, they would have the same system of clearing the fields in that way. And this is a very, old, very, very old pony in this photo. He managed to make it to about 33 or something, bless him. And um, still eating rushes. The, yeah, these were topped the autumn before, I think, and then, um, yeah, he was going through and eating them. So where it's been topped, there's still a lot of debris on the floor, and then that's not good for the plants that are coming through either. But they do eat, all of my ponies have always eaten all of the soft rush if it's green. And then there's the diff different rushes as well, isn't there? Some of them haven't got the, uh, you know, you've been put your sharp fried rush and stuff, they're more palatable to the ponies than the other ones, and, um, but even some of the sheep will eat them when they're really fresh, like this. So some people do weed wipe and have had great success with weed wiping, and if you graze with sheep and get it all really short, then you can weed wipe the fresh growth through afterwards. It's not something that we've ever done, so I don't, yeah, I don't have experience, but I have seen people's fields after they've done it, but I'm assuming it's one of those things you probably have to keep on top of and do every few years, but um, definitely better than just spraying all over but we really notice the difference in the areas of the different rush so see yeah see what rushes you've got because it might not all be soft rush and some of the patches get eaten down really well and but for some reason soft rush isn't something that particularly bothers me i don't know i think i always feel like your fields are in transition and um perhaps that's just one of those things that happens along the way like you get too much yellow rattle at some point and that seems to be taking over and then marshy grassland which we've got quite a lot of, and bramble encroachment down in the bottom. I tend to put the ponies in later in the summer as well, so that they get a bit of time. But I might experiment this year, because they tend to get a bit too big and rank. And the ponies do a good job, but like this year, it depends on the weather. I ended up having to take them out sooner than I wanted to, because they were making a mess. But I don't really feel like they've finished the job of eating the stuff down to the level that I want. These aren't recent photos at all, they were taken a few years ago. So having gone 
from that grazing off the flat meadow and um, being tortured with having a few metres of grass every now and again. Then they get dumped in here when the sugar levels have dropped a bit later in the year. And um, are hopefully not ex going to explode too much. But there is so much, they spend so much time. I mean, Jigsaw there, bless him, he's such a fatty anyway. He, he's just stood there at a bunch of Molinia scoffing that. And they will even eat the dry seed heads. So even though it looks like you're putting them into something and making it a completely unsafe environment from an eating point of view, they have such a range in their diet and they will go in and just pick off gravel shoots and yeah they'll eat all in and out of it first and then they'll start clearing up by the winter if you put them back in in the winter then they end up just leaving you with just strands of the bramble which is so much easier to go then and cut off if you are going to cut them than um, if they're not grazed. Cattle are obviously better if you have the opportunity just because of the way they work, the way they eat, the way their mouth parts work compared to ponies in marshy grassland but they are harder to yeah they're harder to deal with from a management moving around licensing point of view whereas I can stick halters on the ponies and just move them to another field and take them around and um yeah unfortunately I cattle them a couple of years ago which is a bit of a shame but we don't have so we don't have that mixed grazing system now we've only got the sheep and the ponies but if you can get them and if you can get a neighbour to pop them through a gate every now and again then that would be the ideal you probably keep your sheep out of the marshy grass and because they just, um, well, unless maybe sometimes in the winter. But on that site where I cut the hay by hand, it's really obvious that there two sheep got left in one summer. And we went back in and the stalks of the devil's bit scabious. It's like you always hear people saying about not letting sheep in your wildflower meadows because they do just love flowers. But going up there was absolutely amazing that year. I probably cut half the crop that I normally do. Yeah, it just needs two little monkeys. It just was so much lighter. And then... Um, yeah, but the amount of stalks with no actual flowering head or seed head on them was really, really obvious. And um, they just obviously go along and can just nip them off. But then we've seen these guys, little ponies, picking blackberries. So what they can do with their lips and their teeth is quite clever as well. <coughs> um, water holes. <laughs> we've got a few places where it's struggled to get them in, either because of fencing or uh, so many people who've asked me to graze their land but haven't got fencing or whatever and I do rely quite a lot on electric fencing and water can be an issue but in wetter areas sometimes you can get around it. We've done other things like throwing buckets down into <laughs> deep pools of water on our lead rope and trying to pull them back out which is probably um, risking your life a bit but this one yeah I just dug a muddy hole and um, it's amazing. it doesn't actually show on there very much. It's amazing how clear. It wasn't a muddy hole by the time the ponies were allowed in and they were using that for drinking. And by the time, hopefully anyway, by the time they'd finished and um, walked close to it and softened the sides, then these little puddles could hopefully be useful to something else <laughs> as time goes by, as other little critters <laughs> can live in there. But it doesn't always work. It depends on the year. That's just a particularly wet patch of a field. So some of the drier fields, we just have to cart water to sometimes if it's too too dry and yeah, move things around, which is where machine machine work is, I suppose, easier because you don't have those welfare issues. Um, yeah, fencing, exceptionally time consuming, but can work. And um, yeah, it can get you to do, if you've got a drier field, then usually it's easier because you don't have so much preparation to do. But I have on this one because it got so rank, I do it, yeah, I just ended up having to cut a little pass in there really before I could put the electric fence up there because it's just not worth it. But this box was quite comical. It's been lent to me and worked and has been amazing. And then I had um, the children had a fight over something while they were helping me carry it, and a bit fell off. And I was a bit pathetically girly and just collected up all the bits, tried to sort out the argument, took it home, asked my husband to shove it back together again. And he pulled out a bit of grass from the bottom and said, I think you've got something in there. Opened it up, and this very lovely nest that Isabel kindly pointed out was a dormouse. And, um, so we found out we had this whole, so I, whilst it's been in the back of my van and I've had it in the shed for a while and moving around and we tried to work out which field it could have been in at one point. There wasn't anything in it by the time we found that. But um, yeah, so wildlife takes opportunities, doesn't it? It's great. It was just so lovely, but it was also we had no idea that we had just, but then we would treat the lawned area as um, wildflower meadow and cut and clear it at the end of the year. And um, that was all planned, except for when I went up there, somebody camped on it and had fires, <laughs> and the whole lot was just completely flattened, which is a bit of a shame. But, yeah, so I think sometimes it's hard balance to reach, because if you do leave something unloved or untidy, then 
yeah, people don't always realise that um, you're, yeah, you are actually doing something with it. So perhaps signage or something is a better idea to help. Um, yeah, this was one of our innovations when we got fed up with dragging gorse bushes about, really. We needed to clear scrub from an important site and take it down um, to the bottom where we could get the chipper in. They only wanted it chipped, they didn't want any fires. So right down in the bottom end was a place that was safe to get the machine in and um, yeah, safe to leave a pile of chip. And so in order to not damage the grass then, because they'd never had any machines moving about in there and they didn't want tractors or anything else, we were allowed to use a quad bike. So we just, yeah, attached. We cut them, we had to cut down some hawthorn there anyway. So we made a bit of a hawthorn branch tree there, a bit of a rope to the back of the quad. Tied up some knots in the end of a loyal old tarp that is now falling to pieces and just loaded it up with stuff and dragged it. And we never met, we were lucky with the weather there, I suppose, as well, but we didn't leave a mark on the field going through. And yeah, it got loads cleared. <coughs> These, um, another couple of toys, really. Ours is the Alpine tractor on the left. Uh, I'm not sure if they were actually racing each other here or singing hey ho, hey ho, off to work and go or something. But, so Brian is in the digger, which is just amazing. He's such a clever man and has a grab and a funny twisty turny, I don't know what the technical term is it, for the head. So he's paid extra for extra gadgets on his digger arm and has all kinds of things going on there. It's his buck rake on the back of our tractor. And we're very lucky to be able to team up with a couple of other people who've got different kit to us. But Brian in particular is so skilled that even though this was um, the triple size behind that hedge, this was a very heavily um, grazed field that had cows in it all winter. And so it is making a mark. I'm quite chuffed that our tractor is making less marks than it did. <laughs> and um, yeah, he's just so clever. Where there's bits that we've had to go into across big wet patches, we felled willow and stuff and made. Um, path, a brush path, brush mats to go in and then Brian comes back out afterwards with his grab and just picks it all off and pops it to one side and yeah he can sweep things by holding bushes in his grab, it's just a, such a clever, clever man and when we've had masses of tree clearance to do after storms and things or if trees have fallen down over fences he can hold them with the grab while we're cutting through them and remove them and just we would have been here for weeks and weeks if we'd done it by hand. If it was your own site, you could be going out there, I suppose, and doing a couple of hours a day. But still, the manual labour involved, there was so much gorse, there's a lot of willow that had to come off. There's tons and tons of firewood. The farmer who owned this triple SI asked us to leave the firewood for him. So we were allowed to burn on this one where there had been a lot of gorse and bramble. And um, we tracked across. It went a bit wet in the last couple of days. We did this one this winter. But... I was on the saw this day, taking stuff out, trying to get it out from within the scrubby areas. And um, yeah, Brian got hold of it with the grab, and then we came back with the tractor and moved it off to the fire site. And then Brian would move over afterwards and move it onto the actual fire with his grab. But this, the same thing had happened here that I showed you in that first photo um, of the, the bramble starts to come in. A few little saplings come up, nobody's very worried about it. And then perhaps for some reason there's less grazing in there for a bit or something. And eventually it's like, I don't know, a quarter of the field or something ends up being taken over. And um, yeah, it gets into scrubby soil. The photos aren't looking very clear on here. Maybe it's a funny light. But, so we could get quite a lot on the back of the buck rake and move it across and you can see wet patches are uh, starting to develop so we had to suggest that maybe they wouldn't graze this field and reassess it until late summer anyway but um, it's quite it was already grazed quite short so I think perhaps I could actually do with a year off or something anyway so you have to kind of judge things a bit and this was another triple SI and was encroaching in and so it's just to show you what is achievable because it's so easy to look at a site and just think, oh, we're doomed. It's just, you know, it can be so overwhelming. But again, this, I mean, it's expensive because you're having to get the kit there and having to bring them in. But there are options, and yeah, there's stuff possible if you use your imagination. And um, yeah, you can see it opening up, and then that's where you can see the sort of darker area, even though that's some of that is shadows from the trees. The darker area is where there's more soft brush as well, and you can see the stumps of the trees of what we cut out. So we took all of that and we were allowed to make brush piles against woodland down at the lower end. But considering it's marsh grassland and um, yeah, it wasn't 
a particularly dry winter, we were pretty chuffed. We had to make a brush mat to come in along the bottom area where we were putting more brush into the woods anyway. But um, yeah, it's, it didn't make too much of a mess. But the problem here was it was becoming a pinch point. It's, it's actually a much bigger field. And the species that were being looked after are down in the far end and were doing really, really well. But there was um, a lack of movement, then I suppose, between the areas because this very small area of grass on was left. And so hopefully by winding it up, winding it up, it'll be interesting to see what happens over the next couple of years. And then these are our little babies, and um, little and large. And this site, we were cutting bramble, but winching fallen branches and trees back into the woods to preserve the grassland that was out here. So we were just work, yeah, working away, playing, winching, cutting, mowing, and um, yeah, it's just ongoing. And then the, the brand will grow back next year, so you have to keep going back and doing it. But that's something else that you've all seen happening in your field, I suppose, is it's really nice to have big, tall hedges, but then you get branches come out and then the brambles grow up through them, and yeah, then you'll get more saplings. And so unless you deal with that and move it back, um, yeah, it gets to be a bigger, bigger project. And more bracken and bramble, this is just it in the autumn, so when the bracken is falling over on top of the bramble and will smother things the next year. And it looks quite daunting, but actually it's quite rewarding as well, isn't it? Maybe it's just a power trip that you can actually do this kind of thing. It's a big old beefy still, and we've got a mulching blade on that one. And it's amazing what you can cut with that. We've probably spent about £80 on decent harnesses. I'd never bother to use the one that you get free when you get your strimmer in a shop and pay for really good ones and pay for it to be serviced and pay for all of the PPE that you can find to cover yourself and your ears and your eyes and everything else. But we can, yeah, I can spend hours strimming, which is another strange hobby. But it, yeah, when you've got the right kit, it's much more achievable. But then even with a pair of snips and a pruning store and some shears, it's amazing what you can get through. Just if you can make sure that you've got paths through it so that you can see where you can get to, it starts to make everything more achievable. And I did take the children down just to do something one summer and they absolutely loved it. The fact that they can snip stuff and everybody's got a little tool each and um, it's amazing what you can clear. So that was all done with a strimmer, with a blade on it. And then, um, yeah, it's ongoing because obviously the bracken and all the roots of the bramble are still there. And maybe you're fighting something you shouldn't be in. This, this was a private site. and. Um, I think some of it would be planted up with trees, so in a way you kind of question because it would have turned into trees anyway. But that's what they wanted, and um, yeah, so it was all cut. But it's hard, and it's always, a, it's always an argument because you are perhaps destroying one habitat to create another. And like with the dormice, it's like the dormice probably want the brambles on the edges and all the other things, but then you've got other species in the field that need the open space, so you've got to decide a bit what's your priority and if Richard Smith was here and seen that I was talking about cutting down blackthorn saplings then he wouldn't be happy because of brown hair streak so you've got to you've got to weigh up what you want and decide yeah which species you're going to do or do you leave a little bit and both well that's really not very clear that's a wintry shot of a lot of bramble coming in onto a field and then um yeah just the progress of starting to move it back I don't know if you can see it unfortunately this photo has taken a bit further away from the other one, this is stepping back, but we were starting to open it out, try not to be too dramatic the first time we went in there. There's a lot of fallen willow on that side, and this, this is a bit drastic, but can be done. I've only done this at my mum's, I wouldn't think of doing it at someone else's, I don't think, but it's quite rewarding as well. And um, this one was just a very quick fire. We just lit it and it just shot across in a few different patches and then where you can see where there's more soft rush and it was wetter it went out and so we just started again on the other side and that winter for some reason we just haven't managed to graze it as much and so we just did a few quick burns and um, yeah tried to get the top off but you can see it hasn't gone in too deep into the tussocks and perhaps it could have been burnt more than that but we were quite happy because then you get quite palatable millennia coming up the next year. There's still so much debris around, but at least if they're walking about in that and eating some of the millennia, then hopefully they'll leave places for other plants and things to grow up and come through. So there's diff yeah, different options, but obviously if you are burning, you need to make fun with fire service and do all the other things that you want to do and have a plan in place and stuff. So yeah, I wouldn't be very keen on doing it at anybody else's house. <laughs> There you go, really. Sorry. <laughs> That's it. Speed talk my way through.